We're going to start the second half of the panel with some introductions and opening remarks from Anna and Jerry so that they can share a bit more about their own work. Um, I was just reflecting as I came in today that I've been doing research in Indigenous communities or with Indigenous people f since 1993. So that makes me older than I feel, um, but that's not a bad thing. Um, <clears throat> And I thought I would share with you a little bit of kind of how I got on this pathway of doing research um, in Indigenous music. I'm an ethnomusicologist by trade or by definition. Um, and what that means is that my academic training up until I pretty much started my master's degree was learning music and playing Beethoven, Mozart, and becoming really good at piano and Western art music stuff. And then I realized there's a lot of really great stuff in my own backyard. I grew up in southern Ontario, um, pretty Eurocentric family, very blinders were on even though there were a, a huge number of indigenous communities in my area i knew nothing about them so once i realized that i had real uh, passion for ethnomusicology learning about music from other cultures other than the western art music canon i realized instead of traveling to africa maybe i could learn about the music in my own backyard because if i was as ignorant as i was and I've learned after years of teaching that there's a lot of ignorance in Canada around indigenous populations that maybe I could pick up the torch and do something with a local purpose. So I am a non-indigenous person. Um, and I think for me, having been involved um, in the research that I've been doing for over 20 years, I've seen a huge shift in the way that we do research and how we define our research priorities. Um, and I, I think one thing that's really important that speaks to um, where we are today and also thinking about the questions that we want to think about. I, I really like the point that um, Maggie made that it's not about the, um, this, this, uh, the research, research life cycle, but the life, how do you say that? It's the life cycle, the research across the life cycle. Because for me, what I found is if you think about the research cycle, we could break it down into really very simplistic terms. You get an idea, develop a methodology, seek out the answers, write a paper. That's a really kind of basic mundane approach to doing research, but after you get involved in the research community, the research itself defines where you're gonna go and the kinds of questions you wanna ask. So I don't see it as, it's a cycle, but it's also kind of like a figure eight, cause you're gonna go over here, you're gonna come back, you're gonna go over there, you're gonna come back. And much of what you do is based on what people tell you and where they tell you to go, the questions they ask, the questions that they pose. Um, so it's a very organic process when you think about how your research projects are defined. Um, and again, I think I'm mostly targeting non-Indigenous graduate students because that's, th that was my experience. And I think we have a lot of Indigenous experts in the room who can talk about their perspective. But I also think it's important as non-Indigenous people to recognize that we are allies. We have a role in Indigenous research and to be honest about that, I don't think we need to back down from that, but to embrace what we can do as Indigenous researchers. And if you extend that further, I do research, but I also teach. I see a student of mine in the front row here. Um, and I think that's a really important role that we have as researchers, because our research is not just something to be put on a shelf in the library. The research that we do informs our everyday interactions with the people that we are surrounded by. So in classrooms, interactions with my family, interactions with my friends. Once people recognize my research and my um, values and my agenda in life, they're a lot more sensitive and they're also more inquisitive. So I see the research that we do, it defines who we are as people and I think the values that we have in approaching that are really something that we do need to take time to think about. So in terms of where I came from, this is a little bit of um, people like, what's an ethnomusicologist? And I always make my students say that word, well, ethnomusicology. What is that crazy word? Um, I don't, I am an ethnomusicologist. And what that means is I study music outside of the Western art music canon and popular music. So it's a, it's a sub-discipline that's kind of defined by what you don't study. Um, that's kind of the, the, the lazy person's definition of ethnomusicology. It is more complicated than that. Um, but as I said, when I was finishing my first degree, I was really interested in ethnomusicology, thought it'd be really interesting to do something to learn about indigenous uh, musics and cultures in Southern Ontario, that's where I was living. And so the way I went about that, and this ties into some of the things that we talked about earlier today, um, and I think John did a really nice job of summarizing the response to the question about relationships, it's time, it's face time. So once I decided, you know, my master's, U of T, 
groups. I want to go learn about Native culture. I started to go to the Native um, Canadian Centre of Toronto on Spadina Avenue. Every Thursday night was their social. I hung out, I watched. This is open to everybody. Anybody can go. I felt really awkward as the white girl in the corner over there and there were certainly some glances like, what are you here for? You trying to, you know, like there was, there was, I felt that awkwardness. But I persevered and I got to know people there and I got to know the cultural programmer and o over the time of, of being there pretty regularly, um, I found ways that I could volunteer. So I helped organize, you know, apply for grants. I, helped, I, t I tried to write grant applications. I tried to organize things, you know, spend time with people so that they knew that I wasn't just parachuting in to get the things. I really had a commitment to learning. Um, so volunteering, I took Ojibwe language classes there. In urban centers here in Ottawa, Wabano, Minwashin, Odawa, they have com cultural programming that is also open to non-Indigenous people. So that's a really good place if you're interested, say, I want to learn. It's, an, it's a non-threatening place. You can go to a powwow, you can sit there, you can watch, you can listen, you can observe, and, and you're welcome there. So find ways that you can, you can be present and get to know people, spend time, spend, um, you know, it's the connections that you're going to make. Ask questions, but be respectful. Um, so I started hanging out at the Native Canadian Centre, um, and eventually over time, in terms of this, the kind of the cycles of, uh, you know, through the course of my research over time, I was first interested in powwows. This is a public place, it's a public forum, public in the sense that people are welcome to it. Seemed like a safe place to start some research. And what I found after my doctoral research, other questions started to come out of that. So after that, looking at, okay, research on powwows in Southern Ontario, where do they come from? How do the Indian Act, the you know, regulations of the Indian Act, how did that shape powwows and how they formed in Southern Ontario? Then I was like, oh, wait a minute, this is really interesting. Where are the women making the music? The women didn't have a role at the drum. Why is that? So that was the next area that I looked into. So from one project, you could go into the next project because those questions that you see are the questions that, you, you, you see things, you, you can start to ask questions, and then that can take you to the next stage, to the next stage. So um, from powers you know, in Southern Ontario, it was women making music at powers, and what were the teachings around that, and why are they allowed in some places and not in other places, and what did that mean? And what did, what did it mean as, for me as a non-Native woman who first studied powwow music, which is primarily made by Native men, you know, double outsiderness, but again, I asked, you know, th good people, good questions, was guided gently along the pathway. Um, and I think once you establish those connections and show that you're invested and that you, you can give back, you can give back, you know, volunteer your time, do what you can, you know, spend time in the kitchen, spend time in programs to help people out or, you know, help people running the programs. Um, I think that kind of reciprocity is something that, shows you're invested, but also that your time, you value their time by giving them your time. Um, and so this idea of giving back, and I think in terms of where I see myself in the world of ethnomusicology, when I go to ethnomusicology conferences, they're not talking about indigenous research methodologies. Oftentimes they're still talking about indigenous music and what does it mean. But there is within disciplines kind of expectations around what you're going to do, the kinds of research questions you're going to ask. But often there is a place, if you push a little bit, get your elbows out a little bit and say, no, this is important, this needs to be done. Um, and I think as an, a, an, a settler activist uh, ally, um, I, and we've heard this throughout the day, is if you do it with respect, ask the right questions, ask questions respectfully, spend time with people, I think that's, I think that's the, the, the right path, and, and I think it's all about doing it with the right heart. Um, my name is Jerry Lanouette, and I'm from a small Algonquin Anishinaabe community about uh, three and a half hours northeast of here on the Quebec side, and it's Algonquin Barrier Lake. And I moved to Ottawa the first time around 1972 to go to high school. <laughs> I was raised by my grandparents on, uh, on the reserve, and more typically uh, on the land because our reserve is so small that you basically took uh, 100 steps and you're off the reserve. It's uh, 28 hectares. Uh, back then the definition was the land set aside for use by Indians. 
And I think since then they've actually called it a reserve now, the legal definition for the land that uh, our people sit on or live on. Um, pretty stereotypical look in a dictionary uh, definition of what a mainstream Indian is supposed to look like. Uh, both my parents went to residential school. Uh, they met in a TV sanatorium. Uh, my sister Roxanne had her master's in uh, social work. She committed suicide when she was 39. I lost her younger brother Perry to the streets. He died of pneumonia and he was homeless and died out in the city park, uh, Somerset and Lyon here. Um, let's see what else. I'm a diabetic, I wear glasses. Uh, I have a wicked sense of humor. Karen can attest to that. I've known Karen for many years. I use uh, humor as part of my healing, and I do a lot of volunteer work in the community. Um, like I said, 1972, went to high school here. Um, didn't see a lot of prospects for a job for uh, you know, a long-haired Indian uh, living in an urban center. Uh, a lot of racism back then. My first language is not English. My first language is not even French. My first language is Algonquin. Um, spoke French, then English. Uh, when I moved here in 72, I used to say gots instead of have, say uh, tree instead of three, you know, stocks instead of socks, and all the typical, you know, Algon Algonquin French to English words. So the uh, best thing I ever did is I joined the Army. I saw a lot of the sites across the world. I was uh, overseas a number of times, uh, Cyprus uh, during a UN peacekeeping tour. Uh, I was in Germany, Lara, Baden-Baden. Then I uh, came back to Ottawa as my final post, so they asked me where they were willing to give me my last posting to whatever city I wanted across the, the country. And I said, I like Ottawa. I'll stay in Ottawa. So I liked Ottawa because it was clean, there was a canal, there was two rivers, and I could actually get on the water there with a canoe or a kayak and just go up and down. So meanwhile, I joined uh, Canadian, uh, the public service in um, national defense. I uh, started as a mailroom clerk. I think the lowest position at the time there was uh, a CR2, which is what I started as. So I worked my way through the ranks, different government departments, and um, I then joined the, uh, back then it was Department of Indian Affairs and Northern Development. It was Diane, then they changed to Indian and Northern Affairs Canada, and they've had a whole slew of other changes of names, acronyms. Um, so I worked my way through the ranks there. I worked as uh, an assistant to the Director General of Human Resources. I worked for uh, uh, Deputy Minister as an advisor. I managed to build C-31 unit. A um, number of other pretty senior positions there until I transitioned over to Health Canada. I worked for uh, one of the most despicable assistant deputy ministers and ever heard of. His name was Paul Cochran. I don't know if anybody have, uh, has ever heard of him. He was the deputy, uh, assistant deputy minister who got caught on a boat cruise off the coast of Cuba with misappropriation of funds that was supposed to go to this health clinic in Manitoba. And uh, he and his wife had somehow found a way of redirecting these funds for their own personal gain and use. Um, just before uh, leaving his employment, my sister had committed suicide in September of 96. So for about four or five months, I was working, although it was um, a bit of a fog, I was working on transfer agreements uh, in a program policy and transfer secretariat. And uh, one day the senior personnel committee shoots me a file across the boardroom table. It says, here, sign off this transfer agreement. I said, okay, well, you know, I'll bring it back to my desk. I'll look it over and I'll sign it. And he says, no, I need you to sign it now. And I said, well, I can't, Paul. I haven't seen it yet, you know, and there's certain delegation of authority tools that you're given and you have to review its due diligence. So I said, well, I can't sign it yet, Paul. And I know he's quite senior. I was only a director general level at the time and he was ADM. And um, he just tore a strip off me and he said, what's wrong with you people? And don't, don't you understand I'm trying to help you? And nobody had ever seen this transfer agreement. And this is all public information, by the way. Um, so uh, I just threw the file back at him, and I had had enough of government. And I was still a bit of a fog because my sister's suicide and uh, a lot of issues around that. And um, 
tell him this was March 31st, 1997. I told him to take the job and pretty much shove it. Went back to my desk, packed up my box, left. Probably about a month later, uh, there was a knock on my door. It was the RCMP. It was my signature had been appearing on a couple of transfer agreements that there was no backup documentation and so on. So I looked at it and said, mm, that's not my signature. Mm, that's not my signature either. So I did remember that one file. I said, you may want to look up this transfer agreement too because I was asked to sign it and I wouldn't sign it because I hadn't seen it. And uh, sure enough, uh, Mr. Paul Cochran got uh, charged and convicted of a felony, did time in prison, and um, he lost all his uh, benefits as part of his pension and so on. So um, that was my claim to fame, putting away a senior public official for embezzlement of funds. But uh, just to get back on track, uh, I like working in the urban Aboriginal community. I go back to my own community about 70 times a year, which is Rapid Lake, like I mentioned. But I've worked on quite a few of the organizations that you've mentioned. Um, I helped write the uh, first proposal for Aboriginal Head Start, which is now known as uh, Maconsag. Uh, I was on the steering committee that developed and wrote the proposal for Wabano Center for Aboriginal Health, our uh, Aboriginal Health Access Center here. I um, was the president of the board of directors of Odawa for two terms. I brought in the urban alternative high school, figured get hard start, alternative high school, now we have to fill a gap in the middle, so we're working on that right now also. And uh, homelessness was a big thing for me because of my brother, so I um, wrote up a proposal to develop the uh, 510 Rita, which is the uh, Aboriginal homeless drop-in center. And we also brought in another proposal uh, project uh, called the Bandit Bus, where uh, this van go, drives around to different city parks for the homeless and delivers uh, soup, soup, stews, bannock, um, clothing if they have it, any, any referrals to uh, any services that some of the clients may need. Um, so about 2010, I was asked to, and my background, sorry, is um, governance. Not just information governance, but uh, corporate governance, uh, boardroom governance, and so on. So, in um, December 2010, I was asked to help um, FNIGC establish uh, a risk assessment for uh, our funders, which was at the time uh, the Health Canada under the RHS the Regional Health Survey. So, I went in there to do a small project and um, that was supposed to be a 90-day contract, and uh, I hadn't heard anything from my boss, who is still my current boss, that um, she still wanted my services, so I accepted another contract. I went and delivered uh, training to Ontario Minister of Natural Resources on uh, duty to consult and historical treaty rights, so she was a little bit upset that I was leaving. However, she hadn't told me that she wanted me to stay on, so I got to put foot in the table. So she said, okay, fine, when you finish your contract, let me don't, take, don't take another contract. So I came back, and she didn't want me to do any more contracts. She wanted me to become an employee. So I'm still there, almost six years later. So, um, yeah. So I started off working for the organization uh, with, for something that we, uh, I, I was supposed to be doing training and development, but I also picked up on OCAP. So OCAP was a term that was actually uh, developed around 1986 and it was called uh, OCA. Well, if anybody remembers OCA in the 90s, <laughs> we worked together back then and um, back when that was going on, we uh, helped develop the uh, healing lodge of Indian Affairs called Kumik. That was in response to the OCA crisis. So they acknowledged that OCA was not seen as a very good term, so they added the P for possession. But in my mind, OCAP has been around since time immemorial. It's about safeguarding indigenous knowledge, sharing that information in a good, respectful way, and making sure that the people that you share that knowledge is not going to do anything wrong with it. So, in terms of OCAP, uh, the term OCAP really reflects around ownership. I'm not going to really read through the, all the slides, but I have put these up in the front. Pamphlets about OCAP. <coughs> and um, it's the notion of ownership 
um, relates to the information that is held by the community, either by an individual or the community as a whole. So it can be data, information, traditional knowledge, storytelling, a um, number of other things. But the principle just basically states that the community, group, or individual owns that information. So again, control, we were talking about self-determination earlier. Well, control is part of that self-determination because it's an inherent right to that community. And when I say community, I'm talking about a First Nations community. That um, they should have control about what is disposed about them and uh, what is shared and how is it going to be shared. So then access, when we talked about access earlier, about what information are you going to have access to? So it says, we must have access to information and data about themselves and their communities regardless of where it is held. So access to information not, is not only about information that is held within the community. It's about information that's also held by maybe government uh, departments, municipal uh, governments, um, provincial departments or in governments, even uh, school boards, dentist office. And then possession is what I talked about earlier. Like, while ownership identifies the relationship between the people and their data, possession reflects the state of this stewardship of data. So First Nations possession puts data back within the First Nations jurisdiction and therefore within First Nations control. But when I talk about First Nations juris jurisdiction, it's also about maybe repatriating some of that information back to the community, much like artifacts, museum pieces, stuff that is repatriated back to the community. So possession is also a mechanism to assert and protect ownership and control. So as we know, First Nations generally have little or no control about information or data that's held in the possession of others, particularly other governments. So OCAP guides the community in making its decisions regarding how, why, and for whom Sorry, and by whom information is collected, used, or shared. So, although we may have copyright uh, OCAP, all we did that on behalf of First Nations communities. All First Nations own OCAP, and the interpretation we talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, the interpretation of OCAP is unique to each First Nations community in the region. We don't take the cookie cutter approach. It's um, very distinct within, uh, say, a community in northern Quebec, where it would be in the lower mainland of BC. So, why did we um, protect OCAP? So, you know, like we uh, has been mentioned earlier, uh, First Nations have been researched to death. A lot of people go in, do research projects, reports, and so on, but never bring that back to the community, let alone even consult with them. So what we wanted to do is give, avenue, give an avenue to First Nations communities about developing um, research agreements, ethical research agreements. And um, that would also give them the opportunity to uh, minimize uh, bad research in their community, um, unethical research or even making sure that the, the information that is held about them is actually accurate. So um, what's been really interesting over, say, my last six years with FNIGC is when I first started there, OCAP was just a mention in the governing principles and the standards of research within our own internal documents. So what I've done is I've actually taken OCAP out of the road from one end of the country to the other, we actually have the um, a health partnership in the Atlantic called uh, Tweeten. They've actually used the principles of OCAP to develop a partnership. They hold all their data about their clients. Uh, they have data sharing agreements. Uh, so everything is according to the principles of OCAP and how they define them. So they really asserted jurisdiction over that information for the community members. One of the positive byproducts of this has been trademarking of OCAP. 
what we had seen is um, a lot of misuse by consultants going into the community saying that they were OCAP compliant. But we started scratching our head, well, what does that mean to consultants OCAP compliant? How can a researcher be OCAP compliant? Because OCAP does not apply to an individual. It applies to information, projects, programs, whatever is being developed. So we went out and we had it trademarked, and we were able to send out letters from our uh, legal advisor, some of her, you probably know her, Krista Yao. She's my OCAP guru in uh, the legal uh, avenue, I guess, and she's actually uh, really helped me bring uh, OCAP along. So Bonnie Healy out of Alberta, the Alberta First Nations Information Governance Center. Uh, we were having a brainstorming session one afternoon, and she's, you know, people are trying to define what is ownership, control, access, and possession. What does that mean? How do you put that together? And uh, she actually summarized it pretty well. Is, uh, we cannot pick and choose which elements of OCAP that will be followed. They are one. We cannot ignore ownership or possession any more than the four directions can omit the east or the north. So we still stand by that statement. So for stations inherent right in jurisdiction over information and research, um, I won't go through this, but I could keep you here probably all day and then tomorrow. <laughs> uh, but um, it does give leverage to the community when uh, people want to go in and do research uh, based around health, social programs, and services. Because what happens in the First Nations communities a lot of that data is not protected by standard information laws or access to information laws, or privacy laws, unless it's in a funding or contribution agreement. Uh, First Nations are under federal jurisdiction, however, outside of their legislation. So unless a community has actually developed a privacy law and has put that in um, either in their constitution or their bylaws, uh, there's really no protection of First Nations information in the community. So a lot of information that's collected can harm a community, can lead to discrimination and stigmatization, and hard relationships that lead to mistrust. What happened about 10 years ago is non-insured health benefits has a third party manager that manages the non-insured health benefits. A company called Brogan. Brogan sold off personal information to pharmaceutical companies for mass targeted marketing based around uh, diabetes and so on, they, they did. And this was all done without the knowledge or consent of First Nations. So uh, the Assembly of First Nations uh, has actually approached Health Canada about that. They have sought legal avenues. I don't know where it's at yet, but they're still going after Brogan for that. So what we say is First Nations themselves are the only ones that have the knowledge and authority to balance the potential benefits and harms associated with the collection and use of their information. So what is First Nations data? It includes any information or data set collected, created, or held by an individual or organization now or in the future that is capable of identifying First Nations communities, First Nations membership, Indian status, or even residents of the First Nations community. Government's always trying to find out who's living on and off reserve for funding reasons. Well, we don't want to tell them the real answer because it affects the per capita funding in the community. So now First Nations see their information as a resource with value. Researchers would go into a community, do their research project without thought about leaving any capacity behind in the community, or even going back to the final report. We're changing that. We're encouraging people. Uh, if you want to, or researchers rather, if you want to do research within the community, leave something behind for them. Do capacity, do training, um, help them build capacity within the First Nations community. We've been doing the uh, regional health survey since 1996, which was the pilot phase. We're now in our fourth phase. It's called uh, phase three because we can't uh, call the pilot phase phase one anymore. It was already done. Phase one is actually phase two. <laughs> yeah, I know. So uh, confusing as it is, what we have done, however, is um, when we do surveys um, within First Nations communities, we're already mandated by the Chiefs of Assembly to do this research on behalf of First Nations 
the information that we collect belongs to First Nations people. We have research agreements. Uh, what we do in uh, by way of capacity building is we're establishing regional hubs in each region. So we share um, templates for data sharing agreement. Uh, we've helped build capacity by ways of uh, uh, helping them buy servers, uh, bringing consultants around privacy, uh, security. So we leave something behind also. And we also give them back their information. We never get to see their information at the community level. Because by the time we get its aggregate data at the top, so what we do is we give that information, raw data back to the regional level, and the regional level uh, strips down any personal identifiers and gives it back to the community. We also provide um, report every time you do uh, any type of survey or research project. <coughs> so we encourage them to exercise that jurisdiction within your own community. We tell them, you don't need permission from the federal government to do this. You already have that inherent right. Like uh, Nike, just do it. <laughs> like I mentioned, we uh, talk about um, infrastructure and capacity that have to be considered. Where do you begin? Relationship building. Uh, federal, provincial governments, universities, and other organizations hold First Nations data. I mentioned that about repatriation. Uh, where it's not possible, develop a data governance agreement. There's nothing wrong with that. Data sharing agreement that can be reached uh, that effectively maintain First Nations control over the data. Don't release that information without consulting the community. So return that information is the first step. Uh, similar to repatriation, protection of cultural knowledge, medicinal knowledge, regaining sacred material from museums and, and uh, get, or getting back land. So OCAP is, about, OCAP is about legitimizing accountability for First Nations authorities and institutions. And I talked a little bit about the misuse. The term OCAP, uh, although six years ago it was very, there was very little known about it. Now it seems to be the in thing. Uh, a lot of research institutes in academia now are also including OCAP as a term in their uh, materials, which you know, five, six years ago was unheard of. Now it's an OCAP has become the end thing to mention. The other thing that's happening too is people will hire the token Indian from that community and they think that they're OCAP compliant. That's nah, not right. So the other thing that I do also is um, Almost three years of my life, about two and a half, has been devoted to developing an online training program for OCAP. Uh, so the fundamentals of OCAP course has been running since February 15th was the first intake. And we do a monthly intake every month around the, the 15th is a cutoff date until the next month. And we've had, I believe, 150 people have uh, registered since February. I guess the next intake will be June, so it's uh, February, March, April, May, four months. And uh, we've done it in conjunction with Algonquin College. Uh, it was an easier avenue for us. And uh, we will be doing um, a launch of the French OCAP course, and that's uh, scheduled for release July 15th while we're in Niagara Falls at the Assembly of First Nations Annual General Assembly. And my next project is developing a project course for FNIDC for First Nations community. So does anyone have any questions? Yeah. I just had a small question. You talked about uh, information management agreements. I was wondering if there was uh, uh, templates that were available, if there were examples. That were there are. Well, the template is very basic, of course, because there should be a checklist, you know, when you do a data sharing agreement, a research agreement, and there's certain things like building a relationship, what are you gonna do with that? And there's, of course, there's a whole of ethics. I don't have a lot of time, uh, but this is our own internal research, research ethics review function that I have to go through every time a survey or a project comes through, and it's quite detailed. And uh, we also have what we called Another presentation that I was going to talk about was uh, building a research ethics review function. And it's quite detailed also. It's about surveys, information governance, uh, research, 
uh, we have our own research ethic co committee, uh, research advisory committee, and um, we actually have on retain retainer to help me develop this is uh, her name is Karen Weisbaum. She's the former privacy commissioner for Ontario. So she comes back with very strong uh, credentials and uh, she's been uh, very much a uh, very strong guiding light for me on how to approach this and uh, because although First Nations communities have always had their own thoughts and views about this, uh, we're very, um, I guess, oral tradition. Nothing has really ever been captured in black and white so now we're going back to that. We're getting a lot of our review standards, everything documented, processed, accepted by resolution. Even our organization was created by resolution by the Chiefs and Assembly at the Assembly of First Nations. So, uh, you know, it's all about legitimacy and protecting First Nations communities, first of all. Um, while, I, while the pilots are still up there, I, what I don't see throughout the week is, and it's been alluded to a couple of times this afternoon, Around uh, you know capacity building, and don't you know don't hire for the sake of checking off something and hire that token Indian as you put it, Jerry. But I guess the question is is to the panel and giving you an opportunity to expand on what we mean by capacity building because I think um, for me it's uh, it's not just it's not just that uh, hiring of these uh, these these guides to take you out on the land. I don't think it's, I mean, it's like the whole Sherpa um, effect, right? Let's just hire a bunch of, anyways. Um, my sense of it is that there is this, there is this paradigm that in this country that, that, well, you know, the indigenous peoples are just, you know, emerging into university, you know, they're, you know, it's, it's happening, it's slow. Uh, but you no, know, I think there's a lot of great opportunities for capacity building. And this whole theme about reciprocity and giving back, there is, you know, this tendency I think just to make sure you got the certain check marks uh, of your ethical approaches and relationship building, and we don't take uh, the opportunity to really think about, you know, what capacity building could mean. It's not just hiring. It's not just you know training. Hold my stick while I go and, you know, study this plant or something. But I think you know reciprocity in that regard is is, um, you know, what about, you know, the onus seems to be on the researcher within the institution, but what about the institution, right? Because, you know, there's a lot of money in this, there's millions of dollars every year across this country, and to put the onus on the researcher to make sure that you've got an ethical relationship, I think, because of the fact that it's a, a million dollar business plus, I think the institution needs to do some learning too, but, you know, I think, why can't the researcher come back and give a workshop to, you know, faculty about breaking down and creating understandings? Mm -hmm. Why not um, offer a scholarship to the community? Why not, um, you know, there's so many in-kind but as well as financial considerations that we can do towards class building. You know, um, you know, collaborative research. Well, what does that mean? So I think there's an opportunity for all of that. I, I think it would be great to, to hear your perspectives um, because I. It was very interesting on what you were saying. Maybe if you each want to speak to that from your own experience, what has what capacity building meant or what does that look like? At, at the university, I think capacity building can also be the things that we can introduce into the, into the institution to empower or to give voice to Indigenous research by Indigenous students. So some of what we're doing in collaboration with CASE Canadian studies and and you know a, a, there's a lot of overlap between who's doing things uh, but obviously the Aboriginal Education Council uh, you know we, we've for three years now we've had a student focused um, conference so it's you know it's a call for papers goes, goes out everywhere for indigenous indigenous research um, so that's building capacity with our students by creating a form for them to do their research um, the other kinds of things we do are brown bag lunches um, film screening so ways of bringing the research not just into the classroom, not just into you know learned journals that will sit on a shelf, but trying to forge a community across the campus where we can come together and do those kinds of things. The challenge, I think, when you talk about institutional advocacy, is that the people who are who who are committed to this are also the people who are committed to doing everything else. So the indigenous researchers on campus. Um, 
they sit on too many committees and they get asked too many times to do too many things and so there's a, a you know we don't want to say we're going to have another student conference or can you do this we need you on this committee we need you to chair this we need I, I think that's a real challenge, but as an Indigenous researcher, um, I see my role in terms of advocacy and you know, capacity building is to support the students that I have in my classroom. To, if I see a shining star, to say, you should go on to grad school. I will write you letters of reference. Let me do what I can to help you um, or support you through this. Um, so I think capacity building at the university can happen as well. Um, but the problem is, you know, in the same way that we need time to build relationships, we need time to make these things happen as well. And I think just pull, everybody's pulled in so many different directions. So it's not really an answer to your question, except I think there are gestures towards that at the university. Um, how successful we are, I, I'm, I think we're on a journey towards something. I don't think we're there yet. Um, we develop regional hubs where each region's uh, <laughs> representing an organization develops a gateway to hold the information, any tool, software, and so on. Licenses are actually given down to the community level. Um, a lot of the training that we do in the communities is free. What we also do is uh, we encourage um, community members to um, work through our regional organizations, um, actually become employees. We set aside positions to help develop and mentor these uh, people, um, you know, the, to acquire the skills. Um, the other thing we do too, here's a good plug, is uh, we give out two scholarships a year for anybody who wants to go into information governance or epidemiology. So if you go on our website, uh, we offer scholarships every year, two a year. Um, an instance uh, that I just wanted to mention also is some of you may have heard of the Havasupai Indians in Arizona, you know, where the, uh, there was uh, blood and uh, hair samples collected for a diabetes uh, study. Uh, the informa uh, that project actually did not uh, come to completion. Uh, the researcher ran out of money and just abandoned the project, so all the information was boxed up. The samples were left in a freezer. A couple of years later, somebody came in, saw that this information was there, uh, did their own study to try and prove that there was incestuous relationships in the community, and a lot of these people had migrated over the Bering Strait. So, you know, really not what the samples had been collected for, uh, misuse, uh, harmful events to the community. So what happened is the University of California um, was going to be sued by the Havasupai tribe. Um, they came to an agreement the day before the uh, judgments was supposed to be uh, heard in court and what the University of uh, California did is offered uh, uh, scholarships to any and all members of the Havasupai tribe to attend their university. Uh, they built a, a health center to deliver programs and clinic uh, assessments and uh, they came to that agreement before the judgment was rendered, so the, the lawsuit was withdrawn the following day before the judgment was rendered. But uh, yeah, so you know, build capacity in the, in the community when you can. How would you suggest navigating use of terms or ideas that are part of your discipline that might not be inherent to an indigenous community that you're studying? So the, the the example that immediately comes to mind, at least within the discipline of music, is that uh, Islamic prayer, prayer is considered singing, but there is, you could... Musical qualities. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> or in my discipline of religion, the people I've interviewed don't use the term religion. They use spirituality or worldview, but it's religion because it's my discipline is religion. It's not something I can like really skirt around too much. So I'm just wondering if you guys have any examples of this tension, how do you guys navigate it? That could go in your theoretical framework for your thesis, your major research essay, right? This is what the scholarship says. This is how I'm applying it and using it for my own purposes. So it shows you've got the academic grounding in the, scho the existing scholarship and you know what's been said but you're grounding it based on what people have told you and your own lived experience. And you put those in dialogue with each other and I think that shows a, a, a important self-reflection, self-positioning. It's not just here's what they say and here's how it applies. Here's what they say, 
here's how, th how these th the people say, or this is my understanding of it, and that kind of inter interdialogic nature of that discourse, I think is, I mean, that's what scholarship is all about, right? It's putting things in dialogue with each other, and you're the person in the middle trying to make sense of it for this other audience. And I would say don't shy away from the I in your writing. You know, like students come to university and they're like, can I use the first person? And I think in the kind of research that we do, you have to write yourself into it because so much of what you're doing and so much of what we're doing, if you're invested in important self-reflective research, you're invested in it, you have a place in it, and don't write yourself out of it because your interpretation, your understanding, your you know, creating dialogues between different speakers is all based on your experience. So you need to put that, there, there's usually now, I think in a lot of you know, major research papers and you know, the, the kind of ethnographic writing, who are you? What's your background? What's your experience? Because that shapes everything. So I, I would block out a couple paragraphs at least of you know, who are you, where do you come from, why are you doing this research? I, I think that's, I think that's a, a, one of those big shifts that's happened in, in academic scholarships is that you are part of it. You're not just the fly in the wall speculating. Yeah, we, every one of our surveys that we do, we do the methodology uh, according to our in First Nations values. And before we even look at the sampling. Yeah. And then we do the sampling because it does become what people identify as your worldview, right? So. Mm -hmm. And the issue of coming across is gender identity. Hmm within the Aboriginal First Nations Métis community. Um, and for the youth coming up now who are two-spirited or trans or there's many words. Gender neutral. Yes, exactly. Um, they're asking me, they go, I go to an elder and I'll put tobacco and ask them questions about you know me personally and where I fit in. And a lot of them are at a loss of words and they don't know how to answer my mm -hmm. questions. Because this is the next generation coming mm -hmm. up and it's really reaching back into our ancestral past of how there was inclusivity and acceptance of our people who walked various different ways of life. And that was all embraced and everyone was treated equally. But colonialism, other aspects of Earth history, change that and now we're trying to reach down to that history again and, and bring back that kind of respect for everybody. Um, and in the academia field, I mean that's becoming an issue too, right? But I see the youth right now looking towards, you know, going to school, but yet when they consult with elders they feel there's a little bit of a generation gap on views because of the impacts of uh, schooling and, and all of those issues. Anyone have any ideas about that? How we overcome that? Um, I have a lot of interaction with the youth in the urban community here, not only because of my own personal interest, but because my daughter's quite active. Some of you <coughs> may know my daughter, Danny Lanouette, and uh, she's a jingle dance uh, dancer. She does blanket exercises. She does a whole things all involved with youth but um, she came to me probably about three four years ago one of our friends started identifying as gender neutral and she didn't know who to talk to in the community about you know to an elder about it and I said well you know it's something that was really taken away from us you know either through residential schools or the teachings weren't passed on and so on. So, you know, maybe she should start a little circle of her peers. So that's what they started. So this one person, I'm not going to say their name, is, doesn't go by a he or a she, goes by they, is gender neutral. But that's according to an identity that her own peers, or their own peers, sorry, came up with uh, amongst their own circle because all the kids that she hangs around with all have First Nations teachings. They may not be all from the same community, but they're all, you know, fairly local. Kiriganzi B, uh, uh, Nishinaabe, uh, when like uh, maybe uh, Sagamak or, you know, Cape Croker, a lot of even uh, 
tie into Nega. Some of the kids are from there. So the kids from the circle just starting to establish their own, um, I guess, safe place where they could talk about it. So that may be an avenue where, you know, a lot of the youth have to start stepping up for themselves. A lot of the elders don't know. There were teachings that were passed on, it was, you know, taken away from them. With the youth, they, they try to go back to their home community if they have that connection. And they, they feel even more alienated. Mm -hmm. So they go back to the city and they don't want to, you know, out. be totally shut out of their culture and their traditions. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a developing situation mm -hmm. too. I think when it's, there's some positive outcomes right now, so I think that's showing promise, but it needs to be built on more. Yeah. But I think you'll find with a lot of trans, like the GBLTQ community, their family becomes th their community rather than their extended yeah. family. So that might be something to take to the youth to say, you know, if you look at the feminist literature, look at the queer theory, look at the, look at what's being done. It's not people are not finding home or feeling family with their bloodlines. Their family is with people who are like them that come together. So that might be, you know, something you could take back. Even like naming traditions and what someone calls themselves. And I think there was an issue brought up by a young woman um, who was using her her name for herself on Facebook, and her Facebook got shut down because she—that's her identity. And then she raised the issue. Well, there's there's lots of my trans friends who have their name on Facebook. It might not be the name that they use that's on their birth certificate. Mm -hmm. How do we, I mean, these issues are all coming out. Mm -hmm. right? Because everything's online. Mm -hmm. And the more data is available, there can be hurtful data too about mm -hmm. someone's past if it has to do with gender identity. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. But I think in that case, like I was saying earlier, I think the affiliation would be more maybe towards, steer them more, more towards the community, the, 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 the two-spirited community, rather than looking to their home. Because I think that, you know, it, it's, a, it's a conflict of identity. Identity is up there. It's, a, it's something that permeates all of what we're talking about, is this question of who, you know, in and out, who's, mm -hmm. who's there, who's not, and what, how do you wear your identity? And in this case, perhaps their identity as a transgendered person is a stronger marker for them at this point that that's the, the identity they need to nurture and the other one is there for later. Although uh, I remember when I used to live in Manitoba there used to be uh, a couple of uh, two-spirited dancers who were gender neutral mm -hmm. and they were accepted at some powwows mm -hmm. um, to cross those dance and we're seeing again that's reaching back to the deep past because those things and there's the clown culture at ceremonies and, and all those things that are being unearthed them mm -hmm. by uh, scholars and visionists and non traditions. So, so I, I wonder if your question, part of your question is how do you take this new knowledge that's being gained through research and transform the community to make it responsive to it? Yeah, well, legitimately, or, does that have, because sometimes there's mm -hmm. new age movements that go on to these sort of things and there can be misinformed <coughs> aspects of it. But I am conscious of the time, and I know others have commitments and travel and so on to meet. So um, I just I really want to thank all the panelists for sharing your experience and, and all the contributions today. Um, and thank you to everyone for your questions and, and keeping the discussion going. So we have many, many reminders um, to carry us through the rest of the week. And um, especially sticking with me is this idea of research ethics through our life cycle and not limiting it to a project or a funding life cycle. So thank you so much. It's late, but I've been told I'm an elder and elders can go on and on and on and on. <laughs> so I'll go on a little, just a little bit. Two things happen. I'm from Skidigat, it's my village, in Haida Gwaii off the west coast of British Columbia. and. Uh, I had complaints from the Haida people about our teachers. I was the First Nations Education Coordinator. And the people in Haida Gwaii, the families were saying, they never come see us. We have potlatches, which most of those are open, if they're not family affairs, are open to the, anybody who wants to come. And the teachers told me, because I went to them and relayed this, that some of the people are saying, why don't they come to our events? And the teacher and the teacher said to me, because 
we're afraid we're not welcome. You see what that cut off? Don't let that stop you. Open the doors, go through them. Become a circle of friends and learn what you can learn and give what you can give and get into the mix. And I'll tell you one more quick story. We had a curriculum developer, a high language and culture curriculum. She was an expert at translating things into ministry speak, you know, the Ministry of Education, an expert. And she was also somebody who would roll up her sleeves and work with our elders. We had meetings with elders, and the elders got to love her because she kept coming consistently, would translate what they had to say in the ministry speak and do it perfectly. Something happened once. I was giving her the tour of the island when she first showed up, and it showed me her character. We went up north near Masset to Tow Hill, where one of my grandmother's village sites used to be. There's post holes there now. And you know what's in those post holes? Toilet paper. Because somebody, some people have come through and had no respect for what they saw. I said, Wendy, this looks horrible, but come see this. She wouldn't step off the road. And I said, Wendy, why don't you come in? She said, because I need to feel that I'm welcome, and I want to show the proper respect to those ancestors. And when I'm welcome, and they tell me I'm welcome, then I'll come. Four years later, she actually went in and saw the village site when she knew she was ready. You have skills, skills that translate in the ministry speak, research speak, all those languages, and they are languages. They're distinct languages of, in their own right. The people need people that are committed, that are willing to do research that has reciprocity. That's where you come in. Roll up your sleeves. There's a lot of work to do. Don't be afraid of us. Approach us and be prepared to work and become, as Anna said, a very important word. She said, allies. And I love it, allies. Thank you very much for today, for being here, for the spirit I feel present. This is a gathering in which there is, are no barriers. Remove the barriers one by one and keep on talking to one another. Keep the conversation going after this week is over too because we have a lot of work to do. Hawa miigwech. Hapskemnas. Thank you. I had to dig that one out. That's Tekelman. It's a theoretically extinct language in Southern Oregon. And it's a word for the Creator. Something just to take with you. That if people would give a name like this to the Creator, Hapskemnas, it means the children maker. And we are making children. Even if they aren't coming from our own bodies, we're making children by the work that we do, and the children are the hope of the next generation. They will take over from us. So join the children maker, Hapt Gemnas, in whatever you do in your research. Remember the children. Hawa.